He was wanted, dead or alive, for more than a decade. Tonight on Panorama, the full story of how America tracked down and killed its enemy number one. We can say to those families who have lost loved ones to Al-Qaeda's terror, justice has been done. It was the most daring raid. U.S. Navy SEALs stormed Osama bin Laden's secret hideout. None of the good guys getting injured or killed, to me, is like the ultimate dream of. Just how did bin Laden manage to live for five years right under the nose of the Pakistan military? We have caught them red-handed in something that is almost impossible for them to lie about. As far as I know, there has been no double gain. From this house, it's claimed the leader of Al-Qaeda directed terror attacks around the world. Will his death now make us any safer? It was called Operation Geronimo the mission to find the man who deluded the world's most powerful nation and three American presidents. Helicopters would fly a crack team of US Navy SEALs under cover of darkness into the heart of Pakistan. If anything leaked out, it could end in disaster, with many Americans killed, and once again, bin Laden could escape. Pakistan's government wasn't told about the raid. One man knows all about such missions. He served in the elite group of special forces who carried out this operation. Navy SEAL Team 6. You know, I think President Obama did a good job not clearing us with the Pakistanis. Loose lips, sink ships. You've got to get in the target, get rid of somebody evil, and um, try not to get any of your guys killed in the process. The Americans set off from an airbase in Afghanistan. The hope was that this time they'd get bin Laden. Their intelligence indicated he was hiding close to Islamabad, the Pakistani capital, in the town of Abbottabad. I'm on my way to Abbottabad. It's only about 80 miles from Islamabad. High in the hills, the town is cool and green, a place for holidays. It's bristling with army installations, including Pakistan's military academy, the country's equivalent of Sandhurst. Bin Laden's hideout is only half a mile away. Well, here we are. This is the area where Osama bin Laden remained below the radar so effectively for so long. It's quiet, prosperous, middle class, and because of the high level of military installations, it's very secure. It's the one place that bin Laden felt sure of being protected from foreign spies and US attacks from the sky. Well, this is the entrance to the actual compound area. It's sealed off by the police at the moment. We're having to walk through. As I arrived, the police were letting the curious crowd go down to Bin Laden's compound. It's fast becoming a tourist attraction. The compound, hidden by high walls, was built six years ago by two brothers, outsiders from the tribal region to the north. Bin Laden's nearest neighbor, Zian Mohammed, lives with his family just a few yards from Osama's front door. Who was in the compound? Did you have any connections with them? The rumor was that the men who said they were Arshad and Tariq Khan were smugglers. The compound was the biggest in the area. Veiled women would sometimes be driven in and out of the compound in a Suzuki Jeep. 
On the wall, the gas meters show that not two, but four families lived at the property. The compound had a three-story villa with a second building in the grounds. The 14-foot walls were topped by barbed wire. The only way in was through two security gates in a long alleyway. Bin Laden and his family are believed to have moved in by the start of 2006. The men who called themselves Arshad and Tariq lived in the smaller building with their families. Bin Laden, with three of his wives and a young daughter, was living in the main building, and an older son and his wife too, on the second and third floors. It's not what the CIA had thought. Surprise would be the word I would use. Many of us expected that he would be found in a house somewhere, but probably in a village, in a small place where there is very little government presence. For years, the search for bin Laden had been fruitless, despite a $25 million bounty on his head. In the months after 9-11, I went to Tora Bora, to the very caves high in the Afghan mountains where he'd lived. This was the last place he was known to be nearly 10 years ago. US and British special forces had him surrounded after the collapse of the Taliban regime. The very top up there, that's supposedly where uh, Bin Laden's hanging out. But warlords helped him escape. Bin Laden was on the run for nearly a decade. The man who ran the CIA unit set up to hunt Bin Laden down now believes that his quarry still played a hands-on role running Al-Qaeda. He had to communicate with his people. He was far more than a figurehead. He was controlling or at least participating in the planning of operations and the conduct of organizational activities. You can't do that from the back of a, of a 4x4 running around the country hiding. Holed up in the Abbottabad compound, Bin Laden made his last public video appearance, which Al-Qaeda released in 2007. But his home movies, now revealed, show the real Bin Laden. Grey-haired, stuck indoors, flicking through television channels watching coverage of Al-Qaeda attacks. Very different from the man in the propaganda videos, dressed up in a gold robe, his beard dyed and neatly trimmed. But American intelligence now say Bin Laden was more than just a figurehead, actively involved in many terror plots since 9-11. The Bali bombing, 202 people were killed. 192 in Madrid. We have six smoke coming from the tunnel. And 52 dead in London on 7-7. Square. To lead effectively, Bin Laden had to communicate with his followers without being discovered. He was very careful not to use phones or the internet. Instead, he relied on trusted messengers. Couriers have been a part of Al-Qaeda since day one. They carry money, they carry jewels, they carry papers. Sometimes they carry messages that have never been written down and are just oral. Since 9-11, the Americans had been building intelligence on bin Laden's couriers from militants they'd interrogated. The Pakistani intelligence services say they gave the CIA a tip-off, a cell phone number belonging to a man called Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. His international calls raised suspicions. Especially people who were talking to Saudi Arabia and if the telephone and the or the cell is from Pakistan, then we try to monitor that. And this is what would have happened, that some intercept uh, would have been shared. Last year, the CIA struck gold. The cell phone enabled them to track the courier, and he led them to the compound. Al-Kuwaiti turned out to be the man posing as Arshad Khan. His brother Tariq was Al-Qaeda too. This is not an episode of 24. 
What happens is you get a lead, you start to figure out from travel data, or from internet data, from phone data, who this person might be. You're chasing a thousand guys like this every day and you never know which one's gonna be the diamond in the rough. The CIA set up a safe house nearby to monitor the compound. They used thermal imaging and listening devices to try and find out who was in the villa. There was no phone or internet in the house, which was highly unusual. Rubbish was meticulously burnt instead of being put out in the street. The CIA came to realize there was a high-level target inside, even perhaps Osama bin Laden, but they couldn't be sure. President Obama now faced a big decision, whether to put American lives on the line to get bin Laden. Both Presidents Clinton and Bush had failed in their attempts to kill their elusive foe using missiles or bomb strikes. Obama had made up his mind. Though he thought it was little more than 50-50 that bin Laden was there, it was worth the risk of sending in a team to make sure he didn't escape. On the moonless night of Sunday the 1st of May, around 20 Navy SEALs flew into Pakistan under the radar. Your adrenaline is pumping, your vision's sharper, your hearing, all your senses are heightened. Special forces landed from their stealth helicopters. One chopper was forced to land after a mechanical failure. The Navy SEALs immediately split into two teams. One group moved into the smaller building. They killed the courier, Al Kuwaiti, after a short exchange of fire. And a woman was shot dead, caught in the crossfire. The second group quickly moved to the main building, searching for their target. On the first floor, they killed the courier's brother, and on the stairs, they shot bin Laden's son. There's about a million things you have to think of, and you got literally tenths of a second to make that decision. The SEALs moved towards the third floor bedroom. They came face to face with their quarry. It was Osama bin Laden depending on what he does, determines whether he gets shot or not. His wife rushed forward and was shot in the leg. Bin Laden in his nightclothes was killed with two bullets. He's believed to have had an AK-47 nearby and a pistol, but never used them. In the White House, the president and his team were monitoring the attack as it unfolded. The news finally came that bin Laden was dead. It was greeted with silence, and then the president said, we got him. A small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage and capability. After a firefight, they killed Osama bin Laden and took custody of his body. There was euphoria on the streets of America, even though it was the middle of the night. By now, the Navy SEALs were safely out of Pakistan, taking bin Laden's corpse with them. The Pakistani police arrived to find a shocking scene at the compound. Four bodies were strewn around. A dozen survivors, women and children, were taken into custody. Their accounts raised questions about American claims that there'd been a lengthy firefight. What really went on? How much resistance was there? Did bin Laden resist or could he have been captured alive? Was this a mission?